it's quite a difficult question to say whether man has free will or not. From our experience, from the feel of it, it looks that we have free will. If we didn't have free will, we wouldn't be making all our decisions every day. In fact, if one wishes to argue the case for free will, it would be quite easy. I mentioned at the university lecture this afternoon that if somebody says, oh, we have no free will, it's all predetermined, everything is already set, the simplest thing is to offer such a person <coughs> a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and say whether he or she wishes to accept or no. Offer three choices. Will you have tea, coffee or neither? And you have demonstrated the existence of free will. Because whether the person says tea or coffee or none, he, he or she has to say out of free will. It doesn't take too long. In fact, you can carry the argument further and say that not only do you have free will, you are caught up in free will, you cannot get out of it. Even when a person says, I have no free will, he says out of his free will. Because he had the freedom to say he has free will. And the experience in consciousness of making a choice between different options is so real, so personal, that nobody can say that I have not made a decision. I know people saying, I have thought over it, I have come to this conclusion, there is no free will. They are demonstrating free will. The way they say it shows that they are freely willing their own decision to accept that there is no free will. On the other hand, what do we mean by free in the expression free will? In what sense are we free to will? What makes us adopt a particular option or choice? When my friend decides to take a cup of tea in preference to a cup of coffee, he is in fact exercising choice out of his free will in favor of tea. But that the taste for tea, the preference for tea arises out of factors of choice to which he is bound. These factors of choice can be classified into hereditary factors and those which have been acquired through environment, through exposure to life. Maybe his father liked tea, his grandfather liked tea, somebody in the family tree was fond of tea, so in the genes, the preference for tea has come. Maybe his friends liked tea, maybe he was cultured in the tea culture and therefore he likes tea. But whatever may be the reasons, whatever may be the factors of choice, the important point is that when he decides to accept a cup of tea, at that time all the factors of choice are already fixed. He can neither change his hereditary factors, the genetics through which he has passed, nor can he change the environment through which he has passed up to the moment of making a choice in favor of tea. Therefore, if these factors could be identified and put into a computer, the computer could tell in advance that this man at this point of time freely will choose tea. What kind of free will is that? When the factors of choice are fixed, when the factors which determine preference are fixed, how can you be free? And yet one feels one is free. The reason why one feels one has free will is that one is ignorant of the factors of choice. One does not remember what experiences one has passed through. One does not know what the genes are carrying in the biological system. Therefore, the experience of free will arises out of ignorance of the factors of choice. And if we had knowledge 
of how our choice making goes on, we would have no free will. This seems to suggest that we have no free will because we did not have the freedom to decide where we shall be born. When we analyze the factors of choice, we find that the hereditary factors are fixed by one event alone, the event of birth. Being born to certain parents fixes all the hereditary factors. Nothing more is to be done. It's just one moment of birth and all the hereditary factors are fixed. It also appears that all the environmental factors flow from that very point. Your first environment is your mother, then the others around you. And from that, you move on from one environment to another, all in a chain reaction starting from that point. That means the environment automatically follows that one single event, birth. Where you are born, at what time you are born, when you are born, determines not only your hereditary factors of choice, but environmental factors of choice. Therefore, your birth determines the way your free will will act. You have no free will. You had free will. You would have free will if you could choose your own birth. And if you have no choice over birth, you have no free will. Then whose will are you using which looks free to you? It is the will of whosoever has decided upon when and where you will be born. People who believe in God are religious minded. They say that God decides where we shall be born. If that is so, then God alone has free will. The nature of God is difficult to understand. But if we take God as our own totality, our own sum, summation, then in our totality we decide where our individuated self will have the experience of free will and what free will it will exercise. When we become total through expanded consciousness, we acquire the free will of God. What is the difference between free will of God and the free will of man? The free will of God comes from knowledge. The free will of man comes from ignorance. Man does not know why he is acting, so he thinks he is free. God knows why he is doing a certain thing, therefore he is free. The interesting thing is that the free will is one, not two. There is no clash, no conflict between the two. The same free will, the same series of events, the same choices, the same way of functioning of the mind takes place through a will of our own total self and an apparent will of our individuated self. The will is the same. It's a beautiful situation. If we can grasp it, it will change our life. If we can grasp that every time we think we are freely making a choice. It is in fact acting within the choice of our total self of God. If we could understand that nothing can happen, not even a thought in our minds, not even a direction in which to go, except with the will of God, we will quickly learn how to live in the will of God. And once we live in the will of God, the problems of having to make our own choices disappear. And yet we, we are aware that there is no difference between the will of God and what looks like our free will. Because it is one will. One will exercised at the total level, which looks free at individuated level but is not really free, is what we are talking about. Then free will is of one person one power, one consciousness. I said in the beginning, it's a tough question. When we say, is man really free? The answer is, as man, no. As total man or God, yes. But the will is the same. There are not two wills. There is no conflict between the wills. If man's consciousness is expanded to totality, he has real free will. 
if his consciousness is blocked by individuation, he has no free will. Free will then is an experience of freedom that comes through expanded consciousness. There is another side to free will. If we have no free will, can we be punished or rewarded for our actions? If a guy is not responsible for what he does, can you punish him for doing wrong because he can do no wrong? According to the statements I have made, free will belongs to God. What about the guys who go wrong and are punished? What about the guys who do good things and are rewarded? Why shouldn't God be punished and God be rewarded for those actions? Because man has no free will. Man's free will is an illusion. It arises from ignorance. What is this business of reward and punishment? The business of karma as we call it in the East. What is this karmic theory? How does that come up when there is no real free will for man? The answer is, free will for man is an illusion, so is karma. The system of reward and punishment is as much of an illusion as the system of free will and lasts as long as the concept of free will lasts. If we rise above the level of individuation, to totality and discover that there was no individual free will, that God alone was free, we would find that there was no karma, there was no punishment and reward, it was only one stage play with no ethics at all. Ethics and morality come after we are individuated and after we have the illusion of free will. We are often confused about certain spiritual, religious, and mystical writings because we try to relate a statement made in relation to one level of consciousness with another relating to another level of consciousness and they conflict. A statement made about our total consciousness that it is one and is beyond karma is related to another statement at the lower level that indeed our free will looks to be real. And we tie up the two or try to tie up the two and we say, oh, there is no real karma, but we have free will. We can go ahead, do what we like. There is no karma. Both statements are true, but they relate to different levels of consciousness. Both are consistent if we realize that there are levels of consciousness. And if we can understand what those levels are. Karma is a process in consciousness. In this country, the word karma has been used quite often now. And I was a little surprised when Professor Mueller said he is going to title this talk as karmic consciousness. And I said, who will understand what is karmic consciousness? It's a Hindi Sanskrit word from India. But then I suddenly realized, no, it's more of an American word today. When I first came to the United States in 1962 and went about in New York, I saw a lot of cars moving with the word karma written on it. I stopped one of them. I said, you know what's written there? They said, yes, that's karma. I said, where did you pick it up from? They said, from the health store. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what does it mean? They said, they got very nice fresh orange juice. <laughs> and things like that. I noticed that we were using this term in a completely different sense. But apart from that little joke about the restaurant which used the word karma, even those who have studied the law of karma, even those who have been exposed to spiritual writings, spiritual discourses, and have some notion about the Eastern concept of karma, even they make a mistake. They regard human actions, physical activities as karma. The first time I came to this country and met people who were supposedly engaged in the pursuit of self-realization or God-realization, I was very disappointed because those people were so gloomy and dark. I said, are you going towards God? They said, yes. I said, and why are you so gloomy? 
They said, because of our karma. I said, that's amazing. Aren't you going towards the home of happiness, joy, fulfillment? How could you be so gloomy? They said, we are weighed down by our karma. And I couldn't see where the karma lay. <laughs> so I had to ask repeatedly, what do you understand by karma? And they said, well, we are working out our karma. Now we have worked out with one, now we are working out with another. I said, what one? One wife, one husband, second, third. They are working out with several permutations and combinations. They are working out with sicknesses, accidents. They are working out with all the bad things around. I said, I didn't know this was karma. My understanding was quite different. The same thing happened when I gave one of my early talks in Detroit, Michigan in 1963. And after the talk, one old lady walked up and said, Sir, may I shake your hand? I said, why not? And she said, no, I was afraid I may add to your karma. <laughs> I said, lady, pause for a moment. Tell me, how do you add to my karma by shaking my hand? She said, maybe if I shake your hand now, you have to come again to shake my hand. Because that is the law of karma. Whatever you do now, the same thing has to be done again. And I said, lady, how are you sure that I didn't shake your hand previously and now I've come to shake your hand and if you don't shake my hand, I'll have to come again to America. <laughs> how do you know? How do you know whether we are paying off karma or creating karma, if this is karma? Oh no, law of karma doesn't mean these things. Karma is a state of consciousness. Karma is in the human mind. We call that part of the human mind which is exposed to impressions as antashkaran. Antashkaran means the sensitive part of the human mind which can pick up impressions. And the impressions we call samskars. Some scars are the previous impressions of what we have gone through in experience in consciousness. Once those impressions are picked up by the human mind, they stay. And the future course of experience is guided by those impressions. In this situation, where the mind picks up impressions and works them out, is called the law of karma. Karma is a mental activity, not a physical activity. If the mind is unaware of a certain activity, there is no karma. If the mind is aware of a, a certain activity, but there is no physical activity following it, there is karma. Karma is entirely mental. We create karma with our mind, we work it out with our minds. We don't have to work out through physical activity following that. It may or may not. There can be physical activity following a mental decision or there need not be. Karma is there. Karma is an illusion, and as big an illusion as free will, and subsists along with it. Because you cannot be punished or rewarded except for your actions, and you cannot act if you have no free will. So long as you think you have free will, to that extent and that long, you are under the operation of the law of karma. The moment you rise in consciousness, above the illusion of free will, you have also at the same time risen in consciousness above the illusion of karma. Karma and free will are tied up together. Karma then is merely the retention in the human mind of previous memories and experiences. And the working out of future decision making, future mental activity, based upon the previous experiences. When we come with previous impressions, previous samskars on our mind, and then because of those previous impressions, we act in a certain way, this is called pralabdh karma, destiny. Karma of destiny, we call it. Why? Why? Because we are bound to act in a certain way because of the previous impressions. We are destined to do that way. Therefore, these are called fate karma, destiny karma, pralad karma. 
karma over which we have no control. But when we have cleared up those impressions and create new ones through new activity, then those are called the karmas of action which lead to destiny karma in future. These are also called karemaan karma or the karma of new action. What is the difference between the two? Could that lady really tell me whether her shaking her hand with me was on account of a previous karma or was she going to create a new karma so that I should have to come again and shake her hand? There's an easy way out. Since karma is an illusion that subsists and coexists along with the illusion of free will, only when free will has been used, then there is new karma. Otherwise, it's not. In other words, when we have deliberated upon choices and options open upon, uh, before us, when we have considered, shall I do this or not? Shall I do this or not? Openly, in consciousness, when we have gone through this exercise and then make up our minds, that is new karma. And when we have had no chance to think of it, it just comes, that's an old karma. It comes from previous action, previous impressions. The difference between Pralabdha karma and Karemaan karma or the karma of destiny and the karma of new action is very easy. A lot of people confuse it, but there's no reason to confuse. All new karma is built upon a deliberative process when clearly before our mind the choices open to us come and we have to use the so-called free will that, we, that belongs to us. Only when we feel that we have used free will and then come to a decision that there will be a reaction to such a samskar or such a karma. If there has been no deliberative action, no use of free will, there is no karma. In fact, we are paying off. People hit into each other by accident and they say, oh, that was horrible. We'll come back again for this karma. Of course not. They have already come and squared up the karma. <laughs> they don't have to come again. They are now coming again now. They had to come and they have come. They have worked out. They finished their karma. Only when they think out, plan, use free will, look what looks like free will, and then act, then they have to come again. Karma is also tied up with the concept of reincarnation. Because unless we believe that we have a series of lives, it is not possible to fit in all the actions, all the causes and effects into one lifetime. In fact, some very difficult problems arise. A child is born blind. Whose karma? This question was asked of Jesus also. Whose fault is it? At birth, he has had no chance. The child had no chance to do anything. Why is he being punished? By denial of the power of seeing. On the other hand, the Eastern belief in reincarnation, in repeated lives coming one after the other, gives satisfactory explanations to these phenomena. They say he is born blind not because of anything he could have done in this life, but because of what he did in the previous life. Therefore, life's events are all explained, sometimes explained away, through the process of karma of a previous life. And once you have several lifetimes to play with, you can distribute karma over different lives. But sometimes the thought comes to us that the way some of us behave, our karma wouldn't be worked out in one life or two lives. Maybe it may take 20 lives, maybe more, the kind of life we live. How can we jam up all the activity, all the follow-up action of our mental actions of one life? Well, we don't jam up in one life. Once we accept the theory of reincarnation of the human spirit into different forms over and over again, it becomes easy to divide up the karma over several lifetimes. Then what happens to this karma? 
while it is not divided in the life to be led now. The Eastern concept is, it is held in reserve in the same antashkara, the same mind. The mind then does not work out everything that goes into it. It picks up the impressions, holds on to those impressions in its sensitive part, works out part of them in a lifetime, holds the rest for distribution in other lifetimes. So apart from the previous karma which has become part of this life, that is pralabdha, Apart from the karma we are now creating in this life, which is called kareman, we have a third type now, the one that is held in reserve for future distribution and which is called the sinchit karma or the reserve karma or the karma that has not been brought into play. Then it makes it very easy just to go on distributing karma for a period of time. It would seem to us, again, from the way we live our lives, that the sinchit karma must be a tremendous storehouse. We may not be able to go through it in a million lifetimes. And these yogis, mystics, masters, those who have gone through those regions where these karma can be studied and impressions can be read off directly from the mind, they say that is very true. When you look at the sinchit karma, the storehouse of reserve karma inside us, it is amazing. It is so full, we could spend millions of lives, we wouldn't be able to clear it. It's a very small fraction of what, what we have to do, that we come and do in one lifetime. Therefore, this huge reserve that is kept back, that keeps on hanging like a Democles sword over us, and influences us without being part of our immediate mental activity, influences us through moods, attitudes, silent reactions to people, to situations. That karma also affects us in a very subtle way. It's a heavy load and we feel we are under that load. That would be karmic load in on, on our consciousness when we are living here. Karma then is of these three kinds and affects our consciousness. I am suggesting that because we have such large storehouse of sinchit karma, the reserve karma, which is potentially our pralabd for future lives, that large storehouse as a potential source of future suffering, future rebirths, continues to generate its own moods, its own attitudes. And we not only suffer from individual actions and reactions, but also from the general gloom of this big sanchit karma. A person who lives under the umbrella of karma, including sanchit karma, is bound to be gloomy. I wouldn't blame those students of awareness who were found so gloomy because they were under karma. But they only forgot that we have the capacity in awareness, in consciousness, to rise above the illusion of free will and therefore above the illusion of all karma, including sanchit karma. And we can find that indeed, in truth, in reality, there is no such thing as karma. That there is a capacity in human consciousness to go above all karma and reach that level, where not only do we find that the illusion of free will is no longer there, but the reality of free will is owned by us. Where we find that the illusion of this karmic load is not there, but that we are the makers of a play which we watch, there is no real karma. Look at a puppet show. We have in India very nice puppet shows where a puppeteer stands behind and he puts up a screen where his face cannot be seen, his hands cannot be seen, but then the puppets are put on the stage, so he operates from behind and pulls the strings. There's only one puppeteer in our puppet shows, small puppet shows. A lot of puppets are there. The puppets fight with each other. They love each other. They marry and divorce each other on the stage. Do they have karma? How can they have karma? They are puppets. But so long as it, the puppet show is watched only as a show below the level of the puppeteer, they have karma. The illusion of karma, the appearance of karma. The moment we go above to, into the hands of the string puller, the one who pulls the strings, 
there is no karma at all. It's the same thing here that we have karma so long as we have the illusion of freedom of choice. When that illusion disappears, karma disappears. We should be happy if we are students of awareness and are expanding awareness into areas where, where we will transcend karma. There's every reason to feel that we will be able to go beyond this illusion. Why we make the mistake is because we get tied down to the belief of free will even when we talk of freedom from the mind and so on. And because of that belief, we get tied down to the illusion of karma. But I wanted to explain this law of karma so that we do not take it as an independent law. It is an illusion that exists along with free will. The illusions around us are so many that we sometimes feel that real experience is not possible in these illusions. Real experience can be created from an unreal thing. Try to understand this. It's something important. The experience is real. The cause of that experience is not real. It's very difficult for people to understand, but I'll explain. Pain of a real needle through the dream sequence, through dream consciousness. It is not necessary to have a real needle in order to have that pain. So long as we have the capacity to shift levels of consciousness. So long as a needle can be created in the lower level of consciousness of a dream, we can create a real experience of pain. I have uh, earlier also narrated the story of one of the Indian yogis, swamis, which illustrates the same point. There was one Swami Shankar. He used to live near Bombay in India. And he was once walking along a street along with some of his disciples. The story is not to, to be taken literally, but to, to illustrate the point. As he was walking along with the disciples, he passed a street in which a magician lived. The magician could turn something into another form by illusion. He made things look different by illusion. So the magician threw a piece of string on the street and through illusion made it look like a snake. When the master, accompanied by his disciples, came there, he said to the disciples, Now, what do you see there on the road? And they all said, Sir, we see a snake. Then one of the disciples, who had done better homework than the others, had worked hard on yoga and meditation, had realized what illusions are, had got higher consciousness. He said, sir, I tell you, in reality, it's only a piece of string. In illusion, it looks like a snake. And the master said, are you quite sure that it's a piece of string? He said, sir, I'm absolutely sure I've learned this from you. It is, in reality, a piece of string, but looks like a snake. He said, if it's a piece of string, why don't you go and pick it up? And that man stepped forward, and he picked up the snake. And the snake coiled around his arm, and ultimately bit him. When the snake bit him, he said, ouch. And the master said, now tell me, is it in reality a piece of string or a snake? And he said, sir, groaning under pain. Yes, sir, in reality, it is a piece of string. He said, tell me, is the string real or was the ouch real? And he said, sir, the string was also real and the ouch was also real. The point was the same which I'm making now. To get a real experience, you don't need a real object. So long as the illusion is perfect, you get the same experience as you would get from a real object. The illusion of free will creates the real experience of karma. The illusion of this world being real creates real experience with this world. The pain and pleasure that we get in this world are real, irrespective of the fact whether this world is real or not. And this is the process 
that makes karma so real. Because once we take these objects as real, then the whole process of an experience which is real is turned into activity. I once had a discussion with an interesting scholar who had studied the Indian scriptures, Indian classic philosophy and so on. And we have used the term maya, illusion, for this word. That this world which you see <coughs> is maya, illusion, unreal, appearance. It's a world of appearances, shadow. Many words have been used. The term illusion is not correctly used as a translation for maya. Because illusion is that which is unreal. Maya is not unreal. It is unreal in its objective reality. It's real in its subjective experience. That makes all the difference. If you go to see a movie on the screen, would you say the movie is real or unreal? As a movie, it is real. You are seeing it as a movie. But as people moving on the screen, it is unreal. There are no people moving. It's a film that's being projected. But as a projection of a film, it's real. It is a film that's being shown. The experience of seeing the movie is real. We make a mistake in understanding the nature of illusion. When we have a dream, is the dream real or unreal? As a dream, it is real. We are in fact dreaming. Nobody can deny there was no dream. The dream is real. But the things and the people we see in the dream are not real. <coughs> Unreal objects, unreal persons, unreal things can generate and create real experiences. This is what is happening around us right now. All that we see in objective form is unreal. In subjective experience, it is real. The term Maya suggests that what is unreal is taken as real and what is real is taken as unreal. When I suggested that the experience of a glass and the water it contains and the cool drink I get in it is absolutely real, as real as my soul, as real as God, as real as anything. But the glass is not real, they couldn't understand. How can that be? That the experience of a thing can be real and not the thing itself. <coughs> 